that's happened to me relentlessly. So I hope some of you have some of those experiences here. Uh, I get to teach information architecture at the University of Michigan, and uh, two months after this transformative experience of having my identity blown up uh, by Mr. Garrett, Richard Solomon came to my class to get a talk. And uh, so in 2009, shortly after this Memphis uh, thing about there's no such thing as information artifacts, the man who invented information architecture comes to town. And I teach at the School of Information, which is a small department uh, university. The Penny Stamps series is this marvelous uh, speaker series that the art program does. And so I started seeing posters in, I'm walking to class, Richard's, what? Richard Solomon coming to Ann Arbor as part of the Penny Stamps series. And a huge type brought to you by the School of Art. And then a little tiny type also brought to you by the School of Information. So I, uh, I'm just an adjunct. I have no standing in the department. Nobody knows me. Uh, but I did have the dean's phone number. And so I called up the dean and I said, uh, if you do anything for me ever, I'll never ask you for anything ever again. Uh, can you get me into, there's got to be some sort of a fancy dinner or fancy party. Uh, and sure enough, there was, because we were co-sponsoring. I got to go to a fancy dinner with Richard Salvin and a couple people from the art school. And I asked him uh, about the invention of information architecture. And he was surprised by this. Because at that time, he was not being asked to talk about information architecture very much. And he was especially surprised that I knew that he invented it as the chairman of the American Institute of Architects conference, which was in Philadelphia in 1976. And so uh, he's admitted that he can be flattered into uh, submission, flattered into doing all sorts of things, and I think he was flattered a bit that I knew about his work back in the day, and so he gave me permission to call him after this dinner. And that began a series of explorations of me trying to figure out, what does Richard Saul Mormon know about information architecture? How can I get those things? How can I bring it back to the conversation about how there's no such thing as information architecture? And as I kept digging, um, so Richard Saul Merman is an architect in 1976. If you go back 10 years, he is working more as an urban planner. That's Denise Scott Brown at the table there, a world-renowned urban planner. Uh, the things that I was learning about his point of view on information architecture, uh, not only are they there, in 1976, they're there in 1966. And how far back, the further back that I dug, the more consistency I saw in what this guy does. Um, and he's jokingly said he is a uh, sort of a Johnny OneNote, is what he's called himself. And the further back that I go, uh, so 1963, he's teaching architecture in North Carolina. Principles of information architecture, what makes this way of seeing so great, so effective, so powerful? The <laughs> fact that I go, it's not, I'm not seeing the ramp to the declaration of information architecture in 1976. Uh, it's everything he does, including uh, being editor of the high school yearbook. There's Ricky Worman right there in the top corner, uh, designed the high school yearbook. Uh, Information architecture is happening in this yearbook in ways that are jaw dropping. So, what are these patterns of information architecture? Uh, as I'm trying to coalesce these, because you can't, well, maybe you can. It'd be nice if one could. What I was about to say is you can't just indulge in interest without having a product forever. You can't just be reading books and researching and stuff. You have to do something with it. So, I started coalescing these patterns, these things. These are, these are his teachings about information architecture. And he's not standing still. He's 79 years old, and as I'm putting this together, um, and to bring the arc around, uh, Jesse James Garrett invited me to do a talk on Richard Saulberman at UX Week. So as I'm putting this talk together, uh, he puts out an iP iPad app literally three days before this talk. Richard Solomon, 78-year-old man, puts out an iPad app like you do. The patterns that I had started to coalesce that I was going to be presenting a couple days later, still just super much there. So the patterns, as far as I go, and he's still doing stuff. Uh, this year he's launching the Urban Observatory, the second version of the Urban Observatory, something he invented in 1967. Um, he keeps doing stuff. 
and it won't stop. And so uh, I have to stop at some point. So these are the patterns. This is what I think the patterns are. Uh, and where does it all come from? It comes from him relentlessly needing to know that he's doing good work. And uh, the definition of information architecture. Uh, I taught from that polar bear book that we all know and love for many, many years. There are a lot of definitions of information architecture, and when I found this one, uh, this is kind of where it all comes from. That it's not a toolbox, and it isn't a, uh, it isn't when you're gonna do the navigation for something, or uh, figure out the organization of something. It's a whole way of life. It's a way of seeing uh, to make things be good. So, uh, I would love to show you what these patterns are, and my contention is, if you use these heuristically, and, and we've, you've, as an audience member, I too have experienced being given five things from many speakers at the conference, so I realize uh, it's a pattern of patterns to give you five things, but I think uh, five things from 60 or so years of this man's work that you can apply to make things be good. So, what are those? Where I got these from, and my methodology, I will just admit, I'm not an academic. So, uh, all of his books are out of print. He's never done the same thing twice. Nobody's ever asked him to write a book. So, acquiring his books, I did it not chronologically, but just sort of opportunistically. And so I, I've uh, looked at all 83 of his books, and I own most of them, that was my stack. Um, and uh, I think it would be impractical to ask you go out into that body of work to find things uh, to use in your work. So here are the things that I found. Uh, five patterns, and unlike the other speakers, uh, I will go in reverse chronological order. So uh, pattern number five, hacks. Uh, hacks is a really important principle for Mr. Worman, and the first evidence that I've found of him using hacks is a book that he is not attributed as the primary author for. Uh, he's in the second set of authors. And uh, a man who eventually became his partner in an architecture firm in Philadelphia is the primary author, Alan Levy. And this is called The Process of Choice, is the book that this came from. And this illustration is one that Mr. Worman created himself. He's a pretty uh, kick-ass graphic designer. And uh, probably the best place, though, of hats as a pattern for his work uh, comes across in this wonderful issue of Design Quarterly, which is the official publication of uh, of the Walker Art Museum in uh, Minneapolis, I believe. So he got to edit an issue of Design Quarterly in 1989, and the issue is called Hacks, and it has this charming painting by Max Ernst on the cover, and if you look down in the corner of the cover, uh, this is not about hats. So hats is not about hats, um, it is about information. And what Mr. Werman had in 1989 or so, and he later, uh, edited so that it would have a memorable acronym, the one that Abby told you about, uh, LATCH. Um, in 1989, in this uh, HATS book, uh, Issue of Design Quarterly, he talks about how HATS are uh, an analogy or a, meta a metaphor for units of information. And what he had come to understand through publishing, you know, 83 books, and by 1989 it's probably only 70 something and maybe only 30 or so conferences. Uh, what he came to understand as somebody who makes books and conferences is uh, that there are only five ways to organize information. And so if information is the haves, then those five different ways of organizing are like haves. And coming to the realization, and this is uh, deceptively simple how he states it, but if you let this one work on you, and then if you go out to try to say, is this an operative principle? That the way that you arrange things, that the purposeful organization of information because of reasons creates new information. That what you mean is different in an alphabetical order than perhaps than it is in chronological order or in hierarchical relationship. And uh, so it's not a book about hacks. He introduces these five ultimate hat racks, and then he switches the metaphor to dogs, as one does uh, when one is only doing things for oneself. 
He loves dogs. He has three dogs named Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when he ran the TED conference, uh, I think he thinks of himself as a member of the swag bag at conferences. And at the original TED conferences, any testers here, anybody goes to one of the original TEDs? So the teddy bear in the bag looks like Richard Solomon. Uh, he was a little fat guy back then, especially. And so he knew the president of the uh, stuffed animal company that makes these custom dolls for Ted. And so he had this thought experiment. Uh, if I could get that guy to make stuffed animals of every breed, male and the male and female individuals of every breed of AKC registered dogs, this is the perfect illustration of uh, the five habits, or the idea that the creative organization of information creates new information. Uh, to be working in terms of information architecture, you don't get to take any other dog away. So the, the idea here, whether it's hats or dogs, uh, if we were designing the information, if some of the hats or dogs don't fit, well, we just sort of set them aside. But you don't get to change or take away any of the hats or the dogs, you just get to organize them differently for different purposes. So if you organize all of the sporting breeds and you look at them, relative to the toy breeds, that's information. That is a, what you are able to know about dogs changes on the basis of what you can see. How high are the females of the most popular breeds? Is that part of why they're popular? Because they fit in our homes with us? The creative organization of information creates new information, but you don't get to take any of the dogs or the hats away. So applying this to the kind of work that we do in New York Design. Uh, Starbucks, when they present this website, I'm not sure that they are approaching that work with the notion that the way that they arrange this stuff changes what it means. But I guarantee you, if Starbucks gave me a crack at the information architecture of what they do digitally, this would mean quite differently because I would organize it quite differently. Uh, ordering something encodes its meaning in really powerful ways. And that's what this pattern of hats is all about. And one really uh, perhaps beautiful example of this, anybody use paper, Facebook's alternate UI? Uh, hands up if you've used paper. Keep them up if you like interacting with paper better. Only some of you. Okay, but still some of you. I've done informal polls on this. And there are some people for whom Facebook is not something that they can enjoy. They're not capable of enjoying it the way that it's presented in the web page. Or up until recently, the mobile app, not so good. But something about the organization of the same information, suddenly Facebook goes from gossip wall, uh, humble brag town, to beautiful storytelling. This is just because we've arranged the same, same dogs, same hats. Kinds of hats. So uh, that was the fifth pattern. The fourth pattern I call sandcastles. And uh, aren't, isn't it a sandcastle? Aren't they sandcastles? This is a project that uh, Murphy, uh, Murphy Levy Worman was the name of the firm in Philadelphia. These are four beach homes that were built for some people who lived in Philadelphia. They had a smallish piece of beachfront on Long Beach Island, which is about an hour and a half from New York City. And uh, he engaged with them as a group. So not working with each of these families individually, but doing what uh, urban planners and architects do oftentimes, uh, especially who aren't used to uh, residential commissions. Mormon didn't do many residential commissions. Uh, so he wanted to work with them all together at the same time. And this was the solution that was arrived at, sandcastles, quite charming. Um, I went to visit them in 2009, again, firing my belly from information architecture as a thing. Uh, this is what's left of, this is what they built where three of them were. And uh, the four or, or so, rather than voicing an opinion about what's, uh, which one of these built things in the same site is better or worse, trying to think, does what Richard Solomon does or his approaches explain the difference here, the difference between sandcastles and uh, whatever this is. And I think it does. 
Um, in 1976, when he invented information architecture, or coined the phrase at this conference called the Architecture of Information, he gave an interview uh, with the AIA's magazine introducing a character called the Commissioner of Curiosity and Imagination. And uh, the conference was going to have a keynote fable, the reading of a fable that Mr. Warman wrote about the Commissioner of Curiosity Look at Mr. Worman at the time, a uh, little fat guy who goes around saying things that make people uncomfortable. Uh, that's pretty much the commissioner of curiosity and imagination. And in this fable, uh, which takes place in the city of what if, in the land of could be, uh, the commissioner appoints himself the commissioner. Nobody asks him to do this. And he walks around the city and he talks to people. And he asks them about their problems because he sees that Things are kind of messed up in what if uh, in the land it could be. And he talks to policemen and says, crime, we have a lot of that. Uh, how are you going to fix that? And the police say, well, more police, more cops on the beat, more bullets, more Kevlar, more guns. And then he talks with teachers about the condition of education in the city. And they say, it's, it's awful. We don't have what we need. Like, well, how do you make it better? More pencils, more teachers, more buildings, more classrooms paper, more resources. Everyone he talks to. Uh, and so when they get kind of sick of him walking around and talking to people, uh, they ask him what he's found, or sort of what are you doing? And he says, well, you guys only have two words. I think that's the problem with how you're living, why you can't have nice things, is you only have the word more. All of your solutions the problems are about doing more of something that's already been done. And then when that doesn't work, you can say nothing. All you have, and this is a picture from the, the, the booklet of the fable that was given to the attendees at this conference, all you have are the words more and no. And that's why the things that you have aren't good. You need a language of performance, is what Mormon calls it, to talk about what you need. Uh, and so, how do we explain this? Is this not as good as those sandcastles? Well, it would depend on how you were able to state what your needs are. This, to me, looks like, and I drove up and down Long Beach Island looking at all of the other vacation homes, and you can see a window taken from a place down the street, those uh, barn-style doors, in 2009 they were kind of ahead of their time, but I, I, I saw those on three or four other structures. Using the process of more and no, you can get to this, but you can't get to sandcastles because there weren't any before they were. You, you need a language beyond more and no to ever get to something like sandcastles, which the residents uh, delighted in. There's a Look Magazine article or living there. So what is this about? This is a picture of Mormon at one of the sand castles. Uh, one of the things that he said, which is pretty convicting, is that designers, part of why we can't have nice things is because designers are rushing in to try to solve the problem, but they're not asking about the truth. And uh, so what was true for these families, they wanted couches facing the sea. That's what they arrived at together. The language of performance. How do we know what good means? We want couches facing the sea. That's how you get to sandcastles. And that wasn't voiced with any regard to how you get there. And that's the second pattern. The, the shorthand, so if you remember sandcastles, the sandcastle pattern, what's that about? It's about the uh, incredibly hard work of putting what you want and having the right language to talk about what without using the language of how you're going to do it. A client comes up and asks for an iPad app. Uh, that's a how before a what. And Google Wave, uh, moment of silence for Google Wave. Um, I think it's a really uh, prosaic example of putting what, or putting how before what. This is a bag of how. Um, Many of us didn't know how to use it or what it was for. Eventually, they got to a what for this bag of how. And that's an expensive process that 
one of the biggest, most affluent companies in the world can endure. But uh, what if they started with, what are we trying to do here? So putting what before how. It is counterintuitive. Uh, it's easier to talk about some other thing that we can point at and say more of this, more of that, or no, not like that. Um, but really, thinking in terms of what before how, you can just ask yourself, are there tactics in what we're talking about here? If we're trying to figure out what would be good to do, if we're considering, if it's still open, to figure out what would be good to do, um, start with what? Resist the language of how. Uh, next pattern, gathering. Uh, Abby, in her talk, said something that I've not heard her say before, which I uh, fits right in here, which is the idea that if you want, and back to uh, designers rushing to solve a problem and not asking about what reality is, or what's true, she said reality has to be gathered. Um, and so this pattern is the verb of gathering. Or is that a gerund? Uh, it's the word of gathering. And the way that this works throughout Worman's long career, his verb, or of, uh, here's a prototype version of the Urban Observatory that came out in 2013. Uh, across this thing is the maxim, you only understand something relative to something you already understand. And the way that Werman works this pattern in the things that he does is to gather strategically. If you put something that you already understand into the grouping, with things that you don't yet but want to understand, that is an incredibly powerful strategy. And the Urban Observatory Project is a wondrous uh, example of this. Uh, data from cities all over the world about uh, health, uh, industry, um, geography. If you can compare three cities anywhere in the world along the same factors that you're curious about, uh, if you understand one of those cities, you can understand the other two. This is an incredibly powerful pattern. And uh, going all the way back to, this is from another issue of Design Quarterly. He edited another issue of Design Quarterly called Making the City Observable. And this is the first place that he starts talking about the urban observatory, uh, something he invented in 1967. Uh, back to fancy work, Tom. Uh, the fancy word for this is apperception. The taking something that you know, gathering it together with some other thing that you don't know, and using the friction, the inner layer, the catalyst there to understand. Uh, and TED, it's interesting to me as somebody who's become uh, deeply interested in Mr. Warman's work. Uh, I've watched video as much as I can in places that he goes to. Talk. I've been sort of a um, wrangler for him at conferences uh, in the past. And people always come up to him and thank him for TED. And oftentimes what he tells them, because he uh, enjoys discomfort a little bit, is uh, you don't like it for any of the things that I did. He sold it to Ted Anderson. Uh, all the things that you like about TED aren't any of the things that I did. Uh, one of the most powerful aspects of TED that doesn't lend itself to, uh, when you see a TED Talk video, you don't get this, is that the idea of TED, uh, Mr. Worman sat on stage during the conference, and it was a parade of different kinds of things that interested him. And it was the contrast of who is on stage now relative to who we just heard relative to what we will hear next. The, when you run a conference all by yourself, just like when you make a book all by yourself that nobody asks you to make, you can do whatever you want. And so his animating impulse with Ted was to un use the power of this pattern just to delight in the contrasts between uh, Billy Graham followed by Steve Jobs followed by Yo-Yo Ma. The contrasts help you to understand. And he's still doing this today. Um, he recently had a conference called WWW. This is that iPad app that I mentioned earlier. An app captures all of these interesting pairings. Uh, you can 
see a conversation between uh, Matt Groening, the guy who invented the Simpsons, and David Brooks from the Wall Street Journal. I understand one of those guys, don't really like the other one, uh, contract, not perception. Uh, the penultimate pattern that I have for you today is tango. And uh, this is a strange one, and the illustration probably isn't uh, helpful here because Mr. Worman is both of the partners in the dance. Uh, the tango is uh, recently, he gave a talk where I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And after the talk, he has a precept which is uh, you shouldn't take. Q&A after a talk, because there aren't any, all you get is speeches and bad questions. But he uh, did receive some questions after this talk, and somebody asked him, where do you get your inspiration from? And uh, without missing a beat, his answer was fear. Uh, and I think this was like a softball, sort of like, a, tell me about your influences. Fear. Fear of failing. Fear of not understanding. Fear of being embarrassed or embarrassing. Uh, the animating impulse for so much of his work is a tango between terror and confidence. And uh, this certainly wasn't what this young lady wanted. I don't think that's what she was expecting when she asked about the inspiration, but it's a real one for him. And you can map it back like all of these patterns. It doesn't matter where you are on the timeline. This is a picture uh, from a video of the first, ex the first expedition of archaeologists from the University of Pennsylvania to Tikal, Guatemala. Uh, Richard Saul Mormon lied and said that he knew how to operate the surveying and cartographic equipment because he was deeply interested in archaeology. And when they got to Guatemala, he had to own up to uh, his lie. He had no idea how to operate. Uh, he enjoys this. The combination of the terror of, can I pull off this lie? Because I really want to go to Guatemala. No, no Western people had been there in the sense of the Spanish. Um, really want to do this. How do I do it? Uh, it's terrifying to be caught lying. It's terrifying to, but he had the confidence that he knew that he could figure it out reasonably smart guy, and he did. And his name is now on the maps of the US Geological Society of who did the surveying geographically to map T. Paul, um, Richard Solomon, among others, uh, because of difficulty in saying it. The pattern of terror and confidence, the, the catalyst of those two working together is the engine that propels him through uh, an extraordinarily uh, body of work. Uh, you announce something, and then you have to actually do it. So here he is announcing yet another conference, the 555 conference. Uh, it's in the newspaper, so he's going to have to do that. Uh, that's how, this is a little uh, visualization that I made. Uh, it starts in 1955, it goes through 2015. Uh, this is some of the things that he's done through that propulsion system of terror. Okay, so uh, I just have one more pattern for you, and uh, it's the best one. It's the hardest one for me as a lover of fancy words. Uh, it's one of the least fancy words ever. Dumb. Uh, he learned this pattern from his mentor, the architect Louis Kahn, and uh, the question, I don't know if you have this question, but it's an interesting question to ask yourself. Uh, what is the way in? You land a new client, you get the gig, there's sort of a scope of work, but what's the way in? What he learned from Lou Kahn is a marvelous way in is to be dumb. Uh, not stupid dumb, but uh, blissful, ignorant dumb. Uh, Mr. Worman calls it uh, he says that Lou Kahn was the youngest person he ever knew. Lou Kahn was able to do what he did in architecture because he accessed a kind of wisdom that is not based on expertise. 
it's based on wonder. It's based on innocence. And in thinking about how to how do you define, how do you help um, finesse you all's sense of what dumb means? Uh, I was watching TV recently and I saw something that I'd seen a long time ago that I think kind of nails it. So we'll, we'll see if this video works. These tests were conducted over a six-month period using a double-blind format of eight overlapping demographic groups. Every region of the country was sampled. The focus test showed a solid base in the nine to eleven-year-old bracket, with a possible carryover into the twelve. When you consider the robots and transformers total thirty-seven percent market share, and that we are targeting the same area, I think that we should see one quarter of that, and that is one fifth of the total revenue from all of last year. Anyway. The eviscerating, beguiling power of dumb. Uh, Tom Hanks' character in that film is a 12 year old boy in a grown man's body. Oftentimes, when Mr. Worman talks about uh, his key topic is understanding, he talks to them. Uh, what does it mean to understand? Well, can a 12 year old, a reasonably intelligent 12 year old, understand me? The power of dumb. Uh, cannot be overstated, I do not believe. And it's one of the hardest things for we as user experience experts to ever access as a tool. To go into a meeting and say, bug, when he's got the charts and all the data that the, yeah, dumb. Uh, another thing that uh, Mr. Norman has said, which is a little bit cocky, but I enjoy, which is that uh, the reason he's more powerful than we are is because he is more in touch with his ignorance than, than we probably will ever be. He has mastered the ability to, so back to the question, what's the way in? I get to start a project, what's the way in? Uh, rather than starting with the expertise of everything that you've done, uh, what this is talking about is the opposite of that, which is uh, starting with what you don't know starting with ignorance. Uh, 
And innocence, I think, uh, this is another key word, and this is another spread from that wonderful 1989 Acts book uh, that Nathan Shedroff, who many of you uh, know, uh, assisted Mr. Worman with the publication of that. Uh, innocence, the innocence to see things you have always seen in a way that you've never seen them. The ability to get beyond your preconception about how things ought to be. Uh, that's the power of dumb. Imagine if the now uh, disgraced former CEO of JCPenney were to have gone after that gig, having triumphed as the guy who brought Apple to physical retail by saying, yep, yeah, I totally kicked ass for Apple, bringing them to retail. You're JCPenney? We can't. Learn. We're not going to use any of my expertise that you're trying. Let's, let's go on a journey together from what we don't know about how to sell clothes in the mall to, to doing that well. No, it's, he's an expert. Let's have him do all of the things that he did uh, for us because he's an expert. And certainly not starting, not saying bug in the meeting. So expertise expires. Uh, innocence can be lost, and that's a tragedy. Uh, but expertise expires. If you know Mr. Worman's work beyond knowing him as the inventor of TED, this is probably one of the things that would come to your mind's eye, a little TV in your brain. Um, the ability to arrive at, and uh, Massimo Vignelli uh, recently passed away. Uh, he was a good friend of Mr. Worman's. I was amazed to see Vignelli described in the New York Times obituary as an information architect. That was what Vignelli liked to call himself. This map that Mr. Worman made of the Tokyo transit system inspired a similar approach to mapping that Vignelli suggested for the New York City transit system, which was ultimately rejected uh, because it's too dumb. When you're on a bus or a train that only stops at stops, representing the distances between them accurately doesn't matter. So being able to do something dumb by taking away things that, of course it's got to have a this, of course it's got to have a that, um, that's the way that this pattern works. One of the best examples of dumb is the atlas that Mr. Worman designed in 1990. Uh, this atlas, unlike the Rand McNally in the back pocket of your father's Oldsmobile, old uh, this atlas is not organized in alphabetical one of the only road atlases that is not organized in alphabetical order. And being dumb enough to realize that nobody drives across the country from Alabama to Alaska to Arizona to Arkansas, uh, if you were an expert atlas maker, this would never occur to you. It just wouldn't. It's off pattern. It's too dumb. Um, access guides. Uh, using simple pictures and words to really dumb down in the most helpful, understandable way everything from the budget of land use in an urban area to how does javelin work as an Olympic event to uh, what is an electrocardiogram? The way to make all of those things understandable is to uh, be dumb. At least that's, that's the pattern that he's enacted here. Uh, football, another example. Um, so the examples of him enacting this pattern are endless. If you don't, if you have a hard time keeping an architecture, what's an elevation versus a plan? Uh, how about a little pop-up illustration from the book to make it impossible for you to forget the difference between a section and a plan and an elevation? Simplifying without losing information. So you don't get to take any of the hats or dogs away. This told me more about my own body than almost anything I've ever read or tried to use to help me understand my own body uh, by being dumb. Uh, and the kicker to all of this, and something that's maybe a little bit weird about my efforts, my striving to find these patterns, uh, make them uh, graspable, and then try to get them out to people like you all, uh, is he could care less. 
when I first got to meet him at that dinner in Ann Arbor, the first thing that I asked him was, uh, and back to what Jesse James Garrett did or didn't do for this thing that I love, information architecture. So in 1976, you've got a conference. It's called the Architecture of Information. You've got a room full of people. Uh, why were there no, well, how come nothing happened after that? Right? I've looked and looked. Attendees of that conference in 1976, architectural practitioners, urban planners, uh, being given the seats to go think about uh, publications and print and signage and physical space in terms of the architecture of information. How come I didn't see anybody pick that up in 1977 or 78? Where's the army of information architects? And he said, I didn't give a shit about that. I wasn't looking to have a, I do this for me. This is not for the good of humanity. I, ins I would like to insist that these patterns, if you were to use them, if you hold these five patterns up and say, is it, is it, is it, is it, uh, but especially is it dumb, that that could make the world a better place. But he truly doesn't care. He has found these patterns and used them on the basis of relentlessly pursuing what he's interested in. And only that. Um, my interests are a little bit broader than that. Um, so, uh, these are the patterns. Here's another way of saying them. The creative organization of information creates new information. So when you are organizing, you can seriously affect meaning through that act of organization. You can encode a certain kind of meaning by putting the dogs or the hats that way instead of this way. Uh, putting what before how? Way harder than it sounds. Um, is there language in how you're describing the thing that you're about to do that is full of tactics? Are you calling it a website or an iPhone app from the get-go? How do you know it needs to be one of those things? Put your what before your how. App perception. Are there things that you don't understand? Well then gather them together with the things that you do and, and revel in the catalyst of bringing those together, the catalyst of understanding. Uh, terror and confidence. Is anybody here a first time speaker at a conference? I can't really see many of you, but uh, terror and confidence. The putting yourself, another thing that he said is uh, comfort is the enemy. If, if you have something to say, if you want to do something and you're going to try and remain of that thing, um, that, let me know if that works for you. The way that uh, the old man does it is through terror and confidence. And then, uh, last but not least, what if the way in isn't through what you know? Uh, your award-winning work in user experience design, all of the kick-ass things that you've done, uh, what if the way in didn't start from any of that? It started from uh, what a reasonably intelligent developer would be able to understand. Uh, I'm a big fan of Abby Jones, and last night on Twitter, she shared a, a bit of her wisdom that she shared with a junior practitioner. Uh, perfection is an edge case. Uh, I have a friend who is an evangelical Christian pastor who teaches about Genesis by pointing out that when God made the world, he didn't make it perfect. I mean, it's good. And the difference there is there's still stuff to do. It's not done. It's not perfect. But what if it was good? That's what all of this is about, is doing good work. And I think I've observed so much of this work uh, that this guy's done. I think you can get to good through time. So uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Are there? Do I have time for questions or objections? Okay, objections. Yes.